I'm going to quickly introduce our speakers today. First is Ben Hasma, PhD. Ben is a seasoned research and development leader with more than 25 years experience across many specialty business segments. Prior to his current role as product development director at FMC, Ben held various technical positions with TrueGree. Ben is known throughout our industry as a technical expert, customer advocate, and insightful business leader. He holds a PhD in crop and soil science from Michigan State and an executive MBA from the Jack Welsh Management Institute. We would also like to introduce you to Bob Albright, our senior global formulations chemist. Bob earned a BS in chemistry from Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science and MS in pharmaceuticals from Temple University and pursued his PhD from the University of Sciences in pharmaceutical sciences. Since joining FMC in 2010, Bob has been involved in formulations and product development, first in market innovation for Latin America and global specialty, and then North American crop. Now, product development for global specialty. His responsibilities include product development, product support, and interfacing with our manufacturing plants. All that aside, I'm gonna introduce our guys and let them get started on our presentation today. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Susan. Well. <clears throat> okay. So uh, could you put it on the uh, slideshow mode? Yep. Yeah, it. Yep. Okay. Good. Uh, Very good. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Uh, uh, next slide, please. So one of the one of the things that we have at FMC is the safety culture, and we start any meeting uh, with two or more people with a safety share. So briefly, you know, the safety share for for this uh, webinar is the summer first aid must haves. So summer, think about it. There's we're outside. Uh, there are so many different things that can impact us. You know, uh, the sun, sun exposure. If you're out in, in the woods or uh, around the yard, tick exposure, mosquito bites, et cetera. And for those types of things, you need some, some things to help you in case you're, you're exposed. So um, the slide kind of you know, describes, first of all, try to stay hydrated when, when you're outside. Uh, you can never overestimate how much water you're, you're, you're taking in to, to stay hi hydrated. Uh, keep tweezers. Uh, in case uh, you, you're exposed to ticks or magnifying glass, you know, to look for if you, if you have uh, ticks landed on, on you. Uh, having uh, antihistamine, et, et cetera, or hydrocortisone for, for any reaction to bug bites of any kind or poison IV exposure. Uh, it's important to have like ice packs, particularly if you're out uh, fishing or going, doing things in, in, in the woods. It's, it's good to kind of have ice packs to, uh, you know, to cool you down in case you're, you're over uh, exhausted. Having water with electrolytes to keep you hydrated is, is, is a good one. Strong, you know, high SPF sunscreen, and most importantly, um, you know, insect repellents. Those are tools, if you will, to have around uh, if you're by yourself or with family, with kids, et cetera. So, that's the safety share, and I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Bob to kick us off. Good. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this morning, we want to talk about pesticide formulations, and let's get some definitions out of the way first. Uh, a pesticide formulation is a combination of an active ingredient, uh, spelled out really by the EPA what that active ingredient is, as well as a combination of inerts. So water, uh, emulsifiers, surface active agents, solvents, whatever the case may be. Uh, remember, these are not 
we define them as inerts, but they actually interact with both the active ingredient as well as the surface that we put the spray down on. Um, other inerts typically are spreader stickers, wetting agents, preservatives for both in bottle preservation of the product as well as uh, preservation of the product once it's been applied. And then also odor modifiers or fragrances. Um, we'll define a pesticide. It is defined specifically in FIFRA section 2U as any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling uh, any pests. And pests might be uh, insects, they might be weeds, they might be uh, fungies. Also any substances or mixtures intended for use as plant regulator, defoliant, desiccants, and any nitrogen stabilizer. I wanna take a step back here and remind everyone that active ingredients are on the label as an active ingredient and the inert ingredients cannot include an unlabeled active ingredient. Inerts are inerts. Active ingredients are active. So why do we add inert ingredients? Typically active ingredients when we get them from the synthesis plant are crystalline or powdery or waxy or molten liquids. And they're really quite unusable to the end user, to the client. And so what we do is we uh, dilute them, so to speak, in solvents, or uh, we can disperse them in water. Um, but the important thing to do is to make that active ingredient usable to the client. We want to make it easy to use. We want to make it easy to measure. We want to make it easy to mix. And we want it, the final product to be both safe and reduce toxicity to the user. The inerts, I keep calling them inerts, but they make the AI work better. Inerts typically uh, add to uh, plant or insect penetration. It improves the distribution of the AI, makes it sometimes more selective and increases um, efficacy. So when we talk about formulation designations, and you guys all see, you folks all see it on uh, the label. Um, I'll speak to the FMC product simply because they're the ones I know best. So when we talk about Talstar, we know it's an SC. So what's an SC? An SC in the second column, third of the way down is a suspension concentrate or a flowable concentrate. A formulator, as well as an end user, knows that this is a solid, a very small particle that is dispersed typically in an aqueous suspension, typically dispersed in water with surfactants and thickeners. Uh, you can see a little further down suspo emulsions. This is a combination of a suspension concentrate and an emulsion. So, uh, the emulsion might be an organic um, solution of an active ingredient mixed with a suspension concentrate of another active ingredient. So we have an SC plus an EW makes suspo emulsions. Uh, SLs are soluble concentrates. This typically is a water solution of an active ingredient that is has a high enough water solubility as either by itself or as a salt of that active ingredient. So all of these designations have exactly a um, formulation tied to them. At the end of the um, seminar, there's an <clears throat> even longer list. So how do we select a formulation? You know, we evaluate uh, the advantages and disadvantages of one formulation or another. We want to know how, uh, sorry, when the formulation is applied, where it's going to be applied, 
Is it going to reach the target pest and be there long enough? And do you have the right application equipment? And Ben, did you have uh, some comments to this? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so, and, and this is why really sometimes you will find a WDG and an SC and a flowable of a pesticide formulation, whether you're in lawn care or, you know, pest control. Uh, selecting the formulation really takes into account what, what, what you're looking for. Um, are, are you looking for safety? Are you looking for tolerance? Uh, are you looking for uh, staining and staining avoidance on various surfaces? So there are so many implications to the to the um, to the formulation choice. The other thing is that the device or the tank is this for backpack sprayer? Is it for tank sprayer? Is it for um, for, for example a sprayer that's used for fertilizer at some point and then you switch from round to round to a different uh, mixtures, those types of, you know, decision would really dictate how, how, you know, how to go about selecting that, that formulation. Why? Because as Bob was going to go through the rest of the slides, there are implications to that, um, you know, uh, decision. So the picture that you see there on, on the right hand side is a typical situation of a tank mixture where the active ingredients, um, unbeknownst to the user were, were not performing. They were causing clogging of, of the strainers uh, coming out of the gun. It seems like the technicians have to take off the gun several times. And it was a case where there's uh, incompatibility with, with two formulation that simply did not get along. So the fix for that, and I can be more specific, iron sulfate, the fix for that is to go to a different iron source. Um, such as iron citrate. Uh, so it's a, it's not pesticide. Obviously, iron is an is an ad, is a uh, nutrient. But when you combine it with other herbicides or fertilizers, you get to see what what's on the left. So the formula, you have fair amount of settlement. Where uh, if you switch to a different carrier and and approach it differently from a fill standpoint you get that solution that's clear, that's really uh, you know, the way to go. So that's why selecting a formulation is, is critical because it takes into account not only what, what you're gonna use for that specific pesticide, but if that pesticide is gonna be applied in mixtures, in tanks and other devices with other things that's been used in, in, in previous applications, you wanna be aware of, of potential complications. So Bob? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll go through some of the typical uh, pesticide formulations that are on the market and speak to some of the benefits and pitfalls of each. So SLs are solutions. Again, they're typically aqueous solutions. We will have um, antifreeze agents in them, maybe a salt in them, we'll buffer them sometimes. These can either be uh, liquid or dry substances, liquid or dry formulations that dissolve in water. So you can see, for instance, um, the product presentation on the left and the diluted product presentation in water. They're actually solutions. They're like uh, sugar water. They tend to be transparent. Um, an example from FMC is the use of is uh, solitaire WSL, a water soluble liquid. Um, they are quite elegant. They don't, when used by themselves, diluted by themselves, you'll find that they are uh, they are solutions, and they don't clog screens. They they um, are you know apply quite nicely. But as Ben said, you know, when you start mixing things together with them, uh, you sometimes get interactions that precipitate the product. They're easy to handle. Uh, once you mix them in, you don't need agitation. They're easy on equipment, no residue. And we can use them in and outdoors. Um, some of the disadvantages, uh, 
very occasionally you'll find that the water for dilution, depending on the source of the water for dilution, pond water, uh, gray water, for instance, uh, that pH or the suspended solids may interact with the AI. Um, the other real somewhat disadvantage of a solution is it is absorbed into many surfaces, certainly anything that's not impervious, like a ceramic tile, that sort of thing. And so it's absorbed into the surface, into the substrate, and you might have reduced residual activity. The next formulation is suspension concentrate. Again, FMC products like CalStar, uh, Dismiss, herbicide, uh, fungicides, Fame and Kalita, for instance. These are suspension concentrates. These are um, well-ground active ingredients, solid active ingredient particles that are in the micron range. Um, somewhere around three to 15 microns in size, in diameter. Um, the benefits to a suspension concentrate is number one, you get no dusting when you uh, open the package because it's a water suspension. Um, they're quite efficacious. They have good residual activity. Uh, there's very little, if any odor whatsoever because they're in a water suspension. Water is the uh, continuous phase, so to speak. Um, they're not dusty like wettable powders and um, you know they don't have an odor like typical EC compounds. So when you think about suspension concentrates, uh, the suspension concentrate is on the right side of the slide. Here we have a particle size of uh, a micron or greater. Typically fungicides are around mm, two to five microns in particle size. Herbicides and insecticides tend to run about five to 15 microns in, sec, uh, in particle size. They're the largest uh, particle, so to speak, smaller than typical crystals, but largest of engineered particles. Colloidal solutions are those, um, so yeah, colloidal solution suspensions. They tend to run about 750 nanometers. Um, they're right around the wavelength of light. So you get these tindling sort of suspensions. And then uh, true solutions are in the angstrom level or down below 100 nanometers in size. And these are, again, true solutions. They tend to be somewhat transparent with the exception of color. So Ben, you want to talk about <laughs> what happens to some of these SCs? Yeah, so here's what happens over time. Back to the previous comments I made, so over time, whether it's LCO or whether it's pest control operators, particularly when tanks are used for various services using various active ingredients, and of course, you know, herbicides and insecticides don't mix. But there are situations where you have a, a fertilizer tank that's used for weed control, it's used for insect control, you know, for turf grass applications. You have products going in and out throughout the season. Think about this over time. Um, what can happen in the tank is that some of those inerts that Bob talked about or some of those granules based upon the pH of the solution, the temperature of the solution, if the tank sits outside over a period of time, it's not unused, et cetera, things start to settle and you cannot have enough agitation to keep, to keep the, uh, the, the sediments from, from building up over time. So it is really a good practice to uh, for on an annual basis to do a quick inspection, take off the cap of your tank, take a flashlight, look down and, and do a cleaning. There are several ways to clean um, those tanks because over time um, you have, your, the performance of the products uh, would be impacted. 
uh, meaning the product that you pull out of the uh, out of the jug and pour into the tank, or the mixing device that you're using to ship into the tank, uh, is good. However, when it interacts with what's in the tank already on the tank walls, uh, all that sediment, it can impede the performance of the product. So just a little watch out uh, there, and and the telltale sign when you start seeing that the um, the uh, sediment builds above the agitation sparges, and therefore it really does not agitate. Uh, so, uh, you know, be on the lookout for for that because uh, things happen over over time. It's just nature. So, a lot of time, and, and I'm talking from years of experience. Sometimes it's uh, it's in the tank. You don't see it. You don't think about it. But somehow, when it comes to uh, product performance. If you're not seeing the performance from a product, uh, point to not just the application, but also, hey, how is the tank solution holding up? So uh, that's it, Bob. Okay, very good. <clears throat> you know, let's move on to other formulations. Um, these are certainly in the market, but you know, they have a longer history than SCs. So we're talking about emulsifiable concentrates or oil and water emulsions, EWs. Uh, you'll recall, you know, ECs have been around just forever and a day. And an emulsifiable concentrate is the active ingredient that is dissolved in an organic solvent. And along with that active ingredient dissolved in the organic solvent is, um, surface active agents, surfactants, okay? And here on the right-hand side, a little diagram of you've got your oil. So that's the AI dissolved in the organic oil. You've got a surfactant that, that um, actually links uh, the oil droplet with the surrounding water, okay? so this EC is now diluted in water. So the surfactant, there's a water soluble portion of surfactants and an oil soluble portion of the surfactant. And that emulsion, uh, that emul emulsifier um, aids in dispersing the oil droplet in the water. When there is no uh, emulsifier, you can think about um, an oil and water emulsion, not unlike uh, vinegar and oil um, salad dressing, where you can shake it up. And if you put enough energy in it, you, you break it into an emulsion, so to speak, but you set it back on the table and a few moments later, the water and the oil separate. Without an emulsifier, that's what happens to emulsifiable concentrates. Um, Oil and water emulsions are basically uh, pre-diluted ECs in water. Uh, we've added certain surface active agents that will um, that will retain the emulsion for long periods of time, a season, two seasons. Okay. Uh, these typically you see them in the tank mix. They're white emulsions. Um, they again have no suspended solid particles. The suspension is the oil in the water phase. Again, the products here we talk about, uh, for instance, something like baseline or dragnet. When you throw it into water, when you throw the product into water and it's diluted, it looks milky, so to speak. And that milky emulsion has a particle size of about a micron, okay? So advantages to ECs, they're easy to handle. They require little agitation, but some. They're relatively easy on spray equipment and leave little residue. However, some of the disadvantages, ECs, uh, depending on the solvent used, by the manufacturer in the formulation of that EC, if it, depending on how uh, phytotoxic the solvent is, you might end up with some plant injury. 
uh, ECs are absorbed through the skin for the worker, for the uh, final client. Uh, thus, we recommend gloves and that sort of thing. Uh, depending on what solvent is used, we might have shipping and storage issues with regard to flammability or um, uh, combustibility. And uh, ECs tend to be tougher on rubber and plastic hoses and washers and gaskets than SCs. Um, so the next type of formulation I just want to make a few comments on are microencapsulated or capsule suspension formulations. These are active ingredients that are either that are typically dissolved in an oil and then they have a little polymer shell placed on them. So we do this in manufacturing engineering manufacturing, okay? This is not something that happens in situ or in silica in the tank itself, okay? We sell FMC cells as well as our uh, cohort of manufacturing companies. We sell CS formulations. Um, these are done to extend the life of the AI at the residual phase, or it could be used to um, improve the stability of the product in bottle itself. Okay, so capsule suspensions are microencapsulated. Typically low odor. Um, capsule suspensions tend to have larger particle sizes. And so um, some thought needs to be given to um, clogging of sprayers, depending on what size screen is used. I think um, typically people use about a 50 mesh screen for their sprayer, uh, that typically is pretty good. Um, capsule suspensions have time release control. They are uh, stable on porous surfaces. In other words, they don't, they're not absorbed into the surface like an EC or an SL. Uh, there is some variability with respect to uh, complete encapsulation. Uh, there's some variability associated with time to rupture, and they're typically a little bit more costly than, than the earlier formulations that I spoke about. The next type of formulation I want to talk about are microemulsions. These are uh, suspended liquids that aid in bioptake and tank stability. Um, FMC offers a product called Transport Micron. This is uh, by Fenthrin in a microemulsion formulation. These have um, these are have novel surfactant systems built into them. They are emulsions. <clears throat> so when we talk about an emulsion earlier on, I talked about milky looking solutions. These, when diluted, are clear. They actually have a particle size lower than the wavelength of light, so lower than about 700 nanometers. There's no settling or clogging. They behave quite a bit like um, uh, WSLs. Um, good stability on greasy surfaces and porous surfaces, and uh, typically have better biological uptake by uh, pests. So microemulsions, their particle size about 100 times smaller than an SC. Um, we increase the number of particles. If you think about uh, one SC particle down below uh, point number four is equal to maybe 100 to 1,000 uh, microemulsion particles. So for insecticides, they have good um, uh, cuticle absorption and uptake. And, um, you know, because of the number of particles, so if you have one SC particle, an insect has to interact somehow with that SC particle. If you make a microemulsion, 
you might have a hundred or a thousand uh, micro emulsion particles, and it becomes, you know, it becomes a, uh, uh, it, you know, the, the insect can interact more quickly if you have a hundred or a thousand. Uh, micro emulsion particles than you do when you just have one SC particle. Uh, Bob, I can add yeah. a quick comment there. Uh, so basically for, for the pest control operators, if you do a perimeter spray with that micro you know, emulsion, the likelihood of, in, of an insect landing on, on a treated surface is higher and the level of, of exposure is higher and thereby what Bob is talking about, the bioefficacy is higher. It's because of that function. More likelihood that the pests would come into contact with that sur treated surface as opposed to with the SC because of the particle size. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the downfalls is quite often the micro emulsions um, behave like a diluted EC from the standpoint they could be absorbed into a porous surface. Whereas uh, the SC particle, on the other hand, sits on top of that porous surface. Next formulations, uh, aerosols, they're typically used in, indoors, but not always. Uh, they're ready to use, aerosols are always ready to use. They contain small amount of active ingredient because they are built for the direct use of them. They don't require any dilution. Um, if you are outside with an aerosol, they have high drift potentials because the particle size, the aerosolized product is so small. Some other formulations are pastes and gels. Um, these are, uh, formulations that have the AI embedded into the uh, food matrix, into the matrix, okay? They tend to be attractive to the uh, pest. They're odorless. There's minimal exposure to kids and pets and that sort of thing. Easy to place. They're not liquids. They tend to be solids or uh, paste, so to speak. They tend to either, um, they're placed either in the back of appliances, for instance, or underneath appliances, or they're placed with little containers, kind of bait stations, so to speak. Pastes and gels might stain a porous surface. So, you know, you need to be careful when you um, start thinking about where to apply them to. Um, also, you want to remove the old gels at their end of their useful lifespan, and you certainly don't want to have any uh, buildups of these products, just from an aesthetic standpoint. We have dusts and granules. So, you know, dusts have been around just from day one. Dusts are wettable powders. Uh, you can also have dry powders. There are consumer pesticides on the market that are in, for lack of a better term, cheese shakers that you can just sprinkle out onto, um, onto uh, the surrounding area of a house into beds, whether it's vegetable or flower beds, that sort of thing. Uh, they they're, have good residues. And when we talk about dusts and granules, in this case, I'm talking about a dry application, okay? So if you're outside on windy days, you can have a drift potential. Uh, dusts are very fine, dry, inert carriers with AI placed on them. And uh, dusts also might be irritating to eyes or nose, throat, skin. Granules, on the other hand, uh, they tend to have a higher bulk density. They tend to uh, have a larger size. They're applied either, um, you know, there's a number of different ways that granules can be applied. Typically, I'm thinking of spreaders for lawn care. 
but they drop readily into the lawn without dusting all over the place. Yes, and now we have wettable powders and then uh, a slide, a couple of slides later, I'll talk about water dispersible granules. So wettable powders, typically these are relatively high AI loads. These are added to water in a tank that is that the wettable powder is then stirred and dispersed into. Not, you can have some soluble powders. I know FMC offers some uh, soluble granules. Uh, we don't sell soluble powders any longer, but whether it's wettable or soluble powders, they're added to the tank. Uh, where they're either dispersed or dissolved in, into water. They're good on porous surfaces because the AI is embedded into the powder. They're easy to mix and measure. Uh, we sell products that are in water soluble bags. So you just throw the bag into the tank and the bag dissolves. Uh, they tend to also have lower um, uh, toxicity from the standpoint of touching them. Uh, there's less absorption than, for instance, in ECs. Um, some of the disadvantages, you might have inhalation hazards uh, when you're dumping the uh, wettable powder. They require agitation. So the important thing with wettable powders, as with any um, pesticide formulation that's a dispersion. So whether that's SCs or um, um, CSs or wettable powders, they need to be constantly agitated in the tank to get good homogeneity of the suspension when spraying. Wettable powders are harder to mix when, um, harder to disperse well when you have a hard water system. It's polyvinyl. Uh, polyvalent ions, uh, hard waters, 342, 150 or 200 ppm hard water, sometimes harder to get a good dispersion of a wettable powder. And they might be abrasive to pumps and some nozzles. And you'll also have visible residue. Oh, so here are examples of a couple of FMC products uh, we do have a sign off dust. Uh, we do have granules. Uh, we typically sell uh, granules of uh, insecticides. Um, let's see, my last comments would be on water dispersible granules or what are called dry flowables. So these are DGs, WDGs, DFs. Uh, all of these, all of these uh, um, formulation types are all the same. Okay, so DGs, WDGs, DFs, these are wettable powders, so to speak, that have enhanced dry surfactant systems applied to them, and go through more engineering uh, to to make a larger granule than a wettable powder. They tend to be less dusty. Uh, they disperse in water to not only form the wettable powder, they, they disintegrate to the wettable powder or to a soluble solution. And um, they're easier to handle with low inhalation hazards. They have the same characteristics as a wettable powder, but they're made in a larger granule. So uh, easier to handle, uh, less hazard to the worker. Um, so Ben, I know you had comments on formulation summary. Yeah, so in, in summary, you, you, can, you can tell from the beginning of the presentation that really the the, the choice on, on formulation um, is whatever best suits your business and for your you know client needs. 
really the idea of using pesticide is to target insects or weeds or, or, or disease at specific target sites. So you want to choose the formulation for, first of all, safety for your people and for the mixers and, and loaders. And Bob talked about the different formulations and, and their ease of use. Second is the performance and, and customer results. We talked specifically about the uh, the micro, you know, encapsulated versus SC. The particle size has something to do with uh, the product efficacy. Uh, the human exposure, you know, the, the dust, for example, as opposed to the liquids. And then uh, phytotoxicity. So you have uh, throughout the growing season when you're out in the field using some of these pesticides, the weather conditions change, the relative humidity, uh, the soil moisture, uh, and then the exposure of, of the target uh, treated plants or insects would vary. So you want to uh, take that into account. Is the surface where you're going to be applying it, is it turf grass? Is it rock beds? Is it mulch? Um, is it trees? Or are you spraying indoors on, uh, let's say, vinyl flooring, ceramic tiles, et cetera. So the residue, this is where the, the visible residue is, you know, comes into play. And then lastly, your application equipment. So is this hand sprayers? Are you gonna use aerosols? Are you gonna use tight spaces? Are you gonna use wide applicators? All of these variables really dictate which direction um, you're, you're gonna choose. And then lastly is look at it, not in terms of round to round, but look at it in terms of a annual you know, program. Round one, you do this, round two, you do this. So look at that pesticide when you choose that formulation, where it fits in, into your spray program and, and your equipment. And then the good news is manufacturers really by design, they come up with various formulation to meet the various needs. And we hope that this session kind of help educate you on, on, the, uh, uh, on the various formulations and, and the options that, that you have. And ultimately for, from a business end, you know, the formulations have different costs, different, uh, um, so there's the, the cost formula, but look at it in, in totality. Uh, or Susan? But, do, you, um, do we do you want to make any comments yeah. about tank mixes? Because that's your bailiwick. That's yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Bob. I, I'm looking at the time here. So one of the last comments is when you're looking at pesticide combinations, um, you want to do a char test for you know two reasons. One is you want to make sure that the mixing order is the, the right mix so that you don't have interactions and incompatibilities that you cannot see, right? And so it, it's important to allow, you know, time, if you will, to, to do your homework and do it, you know, do a jar test or maybe do a small application in an inconspicuous spot, particularly if you're changing formulation, if you're introducing a new product in, into the mix. Uh, because as I showed you from some of the pictures, uh, what goes in the tank is invisible a lot of times unless you really try to look, but you can see it in a, in a, in a jar test. And I did see one question come through the chat, Susan, that I want to uh, address. Well water versus city water, really it depends upon the analysis of that water and what, what it says. But ultimately they're both good for pesticide applications, um, but you want to check the other things that can only water analysis can tell you what, what they are, so. Thanks again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Don't forget to enroll at fmctruechampions.com.